Pathfinders are presenting December scripture, Galatians 5, 16 through 22, which Doug will be preaching on today. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, 
drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness. What a delightful day. Thank you for your participation. I'm reminded as uh, we think about this day and coming to this time of celebration, if you're visiting with us, uh, this is uh, uh, a compilation of our year's theme. We've chosen 12 texts, one for each month of the year. Texts that uh, were important to our 16th century uh, forefathers and mothers. Texts that appear in their writings often of the Anabaptist writers. Texts that are often on the tongues of the martyrs of the radical wing of the Reformation. And uh, we have been focusing our attention on these. We wanted to draw things together on this last day of uh, the uh, Pentecost season. Now on the church calendar, there are 26 weeks of the Pentecost season. Next Sunday begins Advent, and so we wanted to, to wrap up our themes for the year today. So today we're focusing our attention on the theme text for December. Uh, kind of rushing it a little bit, but uh, we're going to begin our Advent uh, study next week. The Apostle Paul in the book of uh, Colossians uh, reminds or encourages or perhaps uh, challenged uh, the folks there as uh, sometimes we need to challenge ourselves when he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I think this text, uh, we've kind of lived a little bit out of it today. Uh, uh, we've heard some singing by different groups, different of the classes from our congregation. Uh, I don't know if they were psalms or hymns or spiritual songs. Um, but it was a delight to have the participation that we've had together. And the Spirit of God wants to lead us. Let this word of Christ dwell in us richly. That's been part of our year-long theme of letting the word of God dwell in us. Focusing our attention on verses for a whole month. Dwell in that word. And uh, out of that, we can teach and admonish each other. Now, I don't know if there is a lot of teaching going on this morning. Uh, we've had opportunity to focus our attention on these texts throughout the year. Uh, I believe, as someone testified to me today, that uh, they found great encouragement from the verses that they've focused on during the months of this year. And so I think that as we think about teaching and admonishing with the scriptures, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, the word of God encourages us. And so, with gratitude in our hearts, we come and offer our gifts in worship, the gifts that uh, you brought today, uh, in different uh, formats. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of reciting of the text, but we had some reciting of the text. But we've had some other interpretations, artistic impression, and you want to come up closer. I know the picture uh, was awfully dark on the, on the overhead uh, screen this morning of uh, the sculpture here of Ananias and... and uh, uh, Saul. Uh, you may want to walk by that and take a closer look on your way out this morning. Um, and the music, music that guides us. So we've been focusing our attention, and uh, during the month of November, uh, our text was, uh, as the group led us uh, this morning, they didn't quote it directly, but I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. And then uh, the text that we want to focus on today uh, for the month of December comes to us from Galatians 5, and it's been read uh, to us this morning. It's a wonderful, wonderful text. It's a powerful text that the apostle has given to us, and he begins it uh, with, as the title of my message today, Live by the Spirit. The book of Galatians has many themes. 
Uh, well, maybe not many. It has clearly a number of themes, and we don't have time to, to look at those themes except uh, to indicate to us that the Apostle Paul was very focused. He was writing this letter to the believers at the church uh, in Galatia and wanting to communicate a very clear message to them. And part of the challenge was that here were people that were trying to live out their lives under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Or if they weren't, the Apostle Paul thought they should be. And he challenges them in this text that we should live by the Spirit. And he gives us some uh, uh, great teaching that is the focus of uh, our verses for uh, this month. Now, there's lots of ways that uh, we could look at these verses. Uh, the text, you have it printed on the insert in the bulletin, or you can go to Galatians chapter 5 and uh, see it in the context of, of the rest of the book of Galatians, which uh, we really need to, to put it into. Uh, we don't have uh, time to, to tease out all the pieces of this, but as he begins, he talks about living by the Spirit and not gratifying uh, the desires of our flesh. And he spends a fair bit of time detailing this. And uh, again, uh, we could spend uh, the whole month talking about this, this text. There's lots of information to teach here. I don't know how you would uh, study it. Um, when I was looking at this text again, I took the text, and you, the text is in the, in the, the left-hand column, Galatians 5. And what uh, struck me is, is that the Apostle Paul was using a methodology uh, you don't need to read all this. He was using a methodology uh, that uh, listed things, and it was a common practice of the writing of the time. And Paul does this. And, and, I, and I noticed from uh, past reading of the Scripture that in almost every letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, uh, he has lists that are very similar to this one in Galatians. So you can go to Galatians 5 or 1 Corinthians 6, you can go to Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 6, 2 Timothy 3, his writing to Titus. And all of these have lists of things uh, in my work uh, on this, uh, just the beginning work of it. I got lots of different stuff going on in my little chart. I got the yellow highlights of the specifics that are comparable in the list. Lots of things that are very similar. I guess once you write one of these lists, every time you write a letter, it's easy to go back to the list. But the interesting thing is they're not all the same. So that would be something to study. I got red marks on there and green marks on there and underlining under there and boy. Anyway, but I made another chart. And this chart is the piece that we want to focus our attention on today because the Apostle Paul begins this text by saying, live by the Spirit, don't gratify the desires of the flesh. And he lists all of those. But we're going to set that list aside to look at what he actually says uh, that we should focus our attention on, where he says, by contrast, by contrast to the things of the flesh, he says, I want you to live by the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is, and then he has this list as my Sunday school class so nicely sang for you. Um, and so he gives that list. But you notice the Apostle Paul has similar lists in the rest of his, in other parts of his writings, other letters. He includes a list like this list by the Spirit. So he's challenging us. Uh, to, to live our lives in such a way that the Spirit has control, that the Spirit of God can do the Spirit's work in us. And that work is, is to produce love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, generosity, or in some translations it's goodness, we're using generosity, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, Self-control. These are the things that the Spirit of God is going to work in us. It was interesting uh, that we are told, uh, and it's, it's in the writing of the historical, if you study the historical writings, the fruit of the Spirit marked the lives of many of our Anabaptist foreparents. They were known as people of love, and they were known as people as peace. They were known as a people who didn't defend themselves, with force, they used a lot of scripture, they quoted much of the teachings of Jesus, but rather than use force, they were willing to submit to others rather than to seek to dominate others. 
by and large. And, and it is recognized even in the writings of their enemies. So you can go to the people who were writing against the Anabaptists of the 16th century, and they'll remark of the moral standings, the high regard for their lives, and the fact that much of this fruit of the Spirit was evident in their lives. Wow. Well, we sing and we know we talk about this fruit of the Spirit. There is fruit that the Spirit of God wants to produce in us. Now, this is the real point here. The moment you became a Christian, the moment that you submitted your life to become a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit began to produce Christ's fruit in you. The moment you became a follower of Jesus. And it doesn't matter who you are. You could have grown up in a family that was in church every Sunday. You might, have, you might, have, you might be a person. Uh, you know, in my self-righteous moments, I, I pride myself in being part of such a family. And thank God for a great tradition. Every time the church doors were open, my father was not a preacher. Far from it. But every time the church doors were open, our family, we didn't live close. As a matter of fact, for most of the years of my life, we lived more than 20 miles from the church. But we were always there. Uh, we prided ourselves on being dairy farmers, having milked the cows, and being there on time. As opposed to, well, you see, there I'm getting into my self-righteous mode. Those folks that lived next door to the church and couldn't seem to get there on time, didn't have any chores to do. All they had to do was shovel the walk. Well, not on a day like today. Did you notice that? I thought we were going to have to shovel this morning. Didn't have to do that. Isn't that wonderful? Anyway, those are myself. But it doesn't matter if you, you, could, be, you could be a self-righteous person like I was. And have, but as soon as I became a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit began to do a work in me. Or you could be like we've described sometimes people who are, they, they grew up in a community, in a family that knows nothing about God. They don't go to church. Um, they're good people. But the moment the Spirit of God begins to do a work in them, I mean, the moment that they surrender to that, the Holy Spirit begins to do a work of producing fruit in them. Or you could be the most anti-God person there is, and you could try to do everything to hurt people, and when the Spirit of God gets a hold of your life and changes it, and you become a follower of Jesus, in that moment, the Spirit of God begins to do a work in your life, begins to produce fruit in your life. So it doesn't matter where you begin. And the Apostle Paul, a couple of times in my chart, I noticed, said to the people that he was writing to, you, to them, after de delineating that list of following the works of the flesh, he would say to them, like he says in 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you. But you have been changed. You have been washed. You've been sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of our God. The Holy Spirit took us at whatever place we were along that continuum of activity of self-righteousness to anti-God and began to do a work in us. And the Spirit looks to Christ in order to find the blueprint for your character. The Spirit will immediately begin helping you experience and practice the same love that Jesus had when he laid down his life for his friends. Is that love going to be maximized in us? At least not. We're human. But the Spirit of God is beginning that work to develop that love in us. Some of us have a long way to go. It's not perfected in us yet. There may be a couple of you that it's perfected in. But the Spirit of God is at work in us doing that great work. The same joy that Jesus experienced, the Holy Spirit wants to fill us with that joy. He wants us to know the love of the Father as the Father says to Jesus, Son, I love you. I'm pleased with you. So God wants to say that about all of us. And, and so the Spirit is at work producing the joy in us so that we can respond to that great love of God in the way that Jesus did. The Spirit wants to work the, 
the peace that guarded Jesus, even, even as he was being beaten and mocked, that peace is beginning to grow in us by the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the patience that Jesus had. I think of the patience that it must have taken for his most unteachable students, his most unteachable disciples. I'm not sure that they were... I'm not sure the most unteachable were the ones that wandered around Palestine with him. Some of us, we've had to have the Holy Spirit work on our spirit so that we become more teachable. And Jesus has patience. He had patience with Peter. He had patience even with Judas who betrayed him. I think he had a very patient spirit with him. The spirit wants to produce that kind of patience in us. Kindness, the kindness that Jesus showed toward children and sinners. That kind of kindness will soften our hearts towards others. And boy, folks, these days, listen to the news, the rhetoric that is being passed around on these days. And boy, don't we in the church need to have our hearts tenderized. We need the Holy Spirit to be working fruit in us, the fruit uh, of kindness, so that we can really demonstrate the generosity or the goodness that the Holy Spirit wants to develop in us. Because Jesus was a generous spirit. His generosity overflowed because the Spirit was present in Jesus. And that same Spirit wants to produce the fruit of generosity in us. We want to be generous with the people of the world. The Spirit will build the same faithfulness, the same faithfulness that led Jesus to be entirely obedient to his heavenly Father. Lord, Father, let this cup... No, Father, if it's possible, let this... No, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. That faithfulness. The Holy Spirit wants, is, is it in us fully? <laughs> it may be in you. I, I know the Spirit is working, working to produce that fruit in us. The gentleness of Jesus. He was gentle. That kind of gentleness will become evident as the Spirit works in us. The Spirit will teach you self-control so that you will have strength to do what is right and to resist temptation. Now, all of this growth, all of this growth in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit that is filling our lives, should be as natural as fruit on a tree. It's not, it's not so much our effort, although we have a responsibility we can't orchestrate the Holy Spirit. We need to get out of the way and let the Spirit produce that fruit in us. And as I said, it automatically begins when you became a believer. If you're not yet committed, it can begin today if you become a believer and receive Christ into your life. The Holy Spirit will begin to do the work of the Spirit producing this fruit in you. It's a wonderful, wonderful gift. There's nothing that we can do except yield to the Spirit of God to allow it to happen. It automatically begins in us. This is such wonderful good news. And the people of the scriptures that experienced this life in the Spirit, that responded to the challenge of living by the Spirit, demonstrated that their lives were changed. Not because they were so disciplined, but because they allowed the Spirit to be at work in them. Now, I said it's automatic, but it also has a calling to responsibility for us to participate in allowing this to happen. How quickly it happens, how that fruit grows in us, how long it takes for it to become mature in us depends on how completely we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit's activity. And I really believe that that's the challenge that the apostle is giving here. To live by the Spirit means to yield ourselves so that the Spirit can produce this in us. I watched this happen. Miriam's father 
loved to work in the orchard, particularly in his retirement years. And the orchard responded to, to his yieldedness to the, to the work of, the, of tending to the orchard, trimming the trees, taking care of the fruit, and there was an abundance of his fruit. When my father-in-law passed away, Nobody would give those orchard trees much attention, and some of you know what happens. Now, the trees are still producing fruit. Some of it's not, not very attractive. It's fruit. But you see, there's nobody yielding to it. There's nobody tending to it. That seems like such a, a simple thing. It's not. It's complicated. It's challenging. But I believe that the apostle has put his finger on this when he says that we should live by the Spirit. And it happens, the freedom that the Spirit has to work in us is controlled by, I hate that word control because you can't control the Spirit, but we limit, we limit the activity of the Spirit by not yielding fully to it. Yielding to the Spirit to allow the Spirit to mature in us. Love, joy, Peace, the love of God as demonstrated in Jesus Christ, the joy of Jesus living in this world, the peace that dwelt in his heart. The Spirit wants to work a patience and the kindness and the generosity of God in us. We can't generate that, but the Spirit can generate that so that we can be faithful and gentle and live self-controlled lives. Let's pray. God, help us to live by the Spirit, by your Holy Spirit. We want to yield ourselves fully, completely, wholly to your gentle Spirit. Because we know your Spirit has the best intention for us and wants us to be fruitful. May we yield. In Jesus' name, amen.